Hello. Welcome to Introduction to Philosophy, uh, Oakland University, Phil 1100, Fall 19. Uh, my name is Grant Yoakum. I'm going to be your instructor for this course. Um, the purpose of this video is to introduce myself as your instructor, um, to introduce the course, to talk about the general sort of technological requirements uh, for an online course, and uh, to go over possibly the only hard copy in existence of uh, my syllabus, uh, your syllabus for this course. So, um, first of all, who am I? Uh, my name is Grand Yoakum. Uh, if you're feeling fancy, you can call me doctor, but um, I don't stand on ceremony. Grant is fine. Uh, I've been teaching for Oakland University uh, since, uh, what, winter 2005, so um, that's an embarrassing amount of time. Uh, it's, I've also taught for colleges and universities um, in the greater Detroit area, the University of Windsor, Brock University in St. Catharines, uh, where I did my doctorate, my, uh, my master's as well. And um, yeah, just generally, um, I'm a Canadian. And Oakland University has been really nice to me in terms of keeping my commutes down. Uh, by giving me these online courses. So um, I try to do a good job of delivering this online material, uh, much of which will be delivered via YouTube um, in terms of my talking at you anyway. Um, uh, what else about me? Uh, I've recently taken on another job as an academic writing advisor uh, with the University of Windsor, uh, so that keeps me uh, doubly busy, but um, I should have plenty of time to devote to uh, this course as well. Uh, I have twin girls as well who are four years old and starting kindergarten this year, uh, one of whom has um, some special needs as well, so uh, there may be occasional travel involved uh, that takes me away, but I bring my laptop, so you guys never miss a beat. Actually, at one point, I uh, taught a portion of one of these courses uh, from Europe. So uh, it's very doable and online instruction is good that way. It allows you um, to travel and uh, just as long as you've got an internet connection and a device that can connect to it, uh, it allows me to travel as well. So um, it's sort of beneficial that way and uh, sort of the way things are going. Uh, so right at the syllabus and right behind me here, uh, my email address, um, yokum at oakland.edu. Uh, that'll be your primary point of contact from me. Um, I do have an office over in the Math and Sciences building. It's on the sixth floor end of the hall on your right. Uh, it's room uh, 642, uh, but I will only be doing office hours by appointment. Um, you're my students, this is my job, and if you need me to come in, I'm available to do so on Tuesdays and Thursdays in a pinch. But um, it, generally what I find is an offer of a Skype meeting uh, is uh, generally logistically better for all of us. If you need a virtual face-to-face -face contact, I'd be more than happy to schedule something along those lines. Otherwise, that office, um, which you'll find my name on the name plaque with about six other people there, um, it, that, that, that's where you will find me if you're finding me. Uh, it's really important that you contact me with any and all course difficulties if you're not understanding something from the syllabus or from the readings or something about the assignment. Uh, contact me. Uh, it's my job. I'm here to help. I've been doing this a long time and um, I like to think I've gotten pretty good at figuring out how to help students. So, um, yeah, that's me. Uh, now, what about the course? Uh, well, what you'll find on the syllabus for the first half a page is boilerplate that they make me put on the syllabus. Uh, this is effectively the box that the course needs to fit in. So um, it, I take this seriously. Uh, I can, within the bounds of this box, I can do more or less whatever I want with the course and I try to make it fun and interesting for you. But this is what the course has to be. It's a study of the main types of problems of Western philosophy. The readings are chosen to illustrate the development of Western thought from the ancient Greeks to the present. It's offered every semester and you all know this. 
it satisfies the uni university gen ed requirement uh, in Western civilization knowledge exploration area. So uh, that's generally what the course is. So uh, a few things from that, it's gonna be a historical introduction to Western philosophy. Uh, that engages theorists from the ancient Greeks to, eh, we play fast and loose with the notion of present. Um, uh, the, the most modern text that uh, we're going to be reading in this course uh, is eh, roughly 130 years old, but um, nonetheless I illustrate with contemporary examples and contemporary thought, and you'll see in my discussions how I bring in contemporary theorists uh, in dialogue um, with these these ancients, moderns, and postmoderns as well. So um, uh, that is generally um, uh, what the course has to be. Now, um, Gen Ed uh, adds a number of different uh, requirements on here. The important ones. Um, uh, knowledge of the historical events or philosophical ideas of European or American culture. Sure. Yeah, we're going to engage that right from the start. Um, knowledge of how Western ideas or institutions have evolved over time. So again, it's got to be a historical introduction uh, that shows sort of a progression. Right? Um, upon completing this course, um, students should know, know the broad outlines of the history of Western philosophy, being familiar with some of the major problems and their attempts to solve significant philosophical problems. Um, an important part um, of this understanding is the history of the development of ideas from the ancient times to the present. You see it's redundant. Uh, specifically, Phil 101, the old course code, Phil 1100, is designed to, one, introduce students to the important historical texts and philosophy, that is, to know the important philosoph the philosophical ideas of uh, European or American culture. Now, uh, you've probably been to the bookstore and are freaking out at this pile of textbooks. I'm going to calm you down a little bit um, uh, by pointing out that we're going through all of none of these books. Um, this is Plato's Five Dialogues, where we meet a guy named Socrates. We're reading two of these dialogues. We're reading about 49 pages of Plato's Phaedrus, and a lot of it is meet and greet. There's um, probably about 30 pages of meat uh, that we're engaging in here. Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, there are 10 books. We're reading two and a half, um, yeah, three technically. Uh, so um, yeah, that's how much we're engaging here. Uh, we're, this is probably your heaviest um, hunk of reading. Um, I'm taking you from chapter, what, six uh, through chapter um, 18, 19. I forget, it's on my, it's on my syllabus. It, that's the thing. Um, it, generally, the answer to your question is going to be on your syllabus. Yeah, it's chapter 6 through 19, uh, but they are short, and I take you through um, the broad outlines of the argument. So you should be able to engage with that. Uh, this is a big, ugly text, but um, it's also the best translation of the two works uh, that I want. Um, it, there should be a ton of used copies of this. Um, I've been using it for semester after semester after semester. And really, it is a great Kierkegaard textbook. The Hongs are excellent translators. Um, we're reading two very short dialogues in this largest book here, right? Um, and then finally, the portable Nietzsche. Uh, these are, like, what did I pay for this used? Five bucks, right? So. Um, there have been a ton of these published. Um, it's Penguin, it's designed to be sort of your introduction to Nietzsche, and we're reading um, a, a few small parts of uh, one of um, the texts that's uh, in here complete, uh, Twilight of the Idols. I'm just taking you uh, through the end of the section entitled Morality is Anti-Nature. So I try to keep the readings very manageable for this course. If you're having trouble keeping up, let me know, uh, and I might be able to streamline things somewhat. So um, those are the texts. I'm supposed to introduce you to the text, students, texts, text, students.
you're introduced. We'll go in detail um, as the semester goes on. What else are we supposed to do here? Uh, to show students how uh, philosophical theories have developed over time. We've already said that twice. That's your third redundancy there. Um, now to develop students' facility using logic or reasoning to analyze and evaluate philosophical arguments. All right? So you're going to have to read and critically evaluate. It's one of those courses. All right? And then uh, finally, and I take this one very seriously, um, to develop students' facility and clear, clear presentation uh, of arguments in writing. All right? So this has to be one of those courses where you write. All right? So generally, um, that is uh, what the course has to be. What I do with this course is um, I pick what I consider to be some of the most important or most relevant um, philosophical texts, starting with the ancients. Um, you'll start off with video material uh, discussing the pre-Socratic philosophers, which is a fancy way of saying before Socrates. That'll give you background to get into the two uh, Socratic dialogues from the five dialogues that we're engaging in, um, the Apology and the Credo. The Apology is, well, the, the most unapologetic apology you'll ever come across. It's sort of a sorry, not sorry. Now, um, it's intended as Socrates' trial defense. He was brought up on charges of corrupting the youth and not believing in the gods of the state, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but I'll show you how. To the Athenians, it was. Um, now, it, what Socrates does in his defense is lays out an argument that laid, lays bare the necessary preconditions for a functioning democracy and shows how he's useful to it. So um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting uh, text to engage with, especially in the contemporary moments where um, it's it, what it means to be a, a, a citizen in the context of a modern democracy are being debated pretty vigorously uh, across the world, right? Both in Canada, the United States, and Europe, and Australia, etc., etc., etc. If you're a democracy, you're wondering what the heck that means right now. So it's good to go back to Socrates and look at that. Now, um, Socrates also uh, sort of creates ex nihilo, out of nothing, um, a, a robust ethical theory. Right as well. Right, so we'll take a look at that, um, and uh, I like to think of the Apology as a dialogue that's about rights. Right, and then we move to the Credo, um, which I like to think of as more of a dialogue about duties. Right, so wherever there are rights, there are duties. Wherever there are duties, there are rights as well. Right, so we'll see how these things go hand in hand in Socrates' account of it. Right, so that's where we'll start. Now, uh, moving on from there, we will turn to Plato, um, which is confusing because uh, you'll notice Plato's name is on the cover of Five Dialogues. Um, these are mostly early dialogues. The ones we're looking at are thought to be a reportage of Socrates' position. Whereas Plato's later dialogues, I'm making a distinction that not everybody makes, but you know, it's, I'll say more about that. Plato's later dialogues, including the Phaedrus, we meet a character Socrates who is arguing things that, if Plato's account of Socrates' position is correct, Plato or Socrates himself would never argue. Right. So um, we're also, and this dialogue is sort of an outlier as well, we're meeting a character Socrates that's put in situations and given tasks that the historical Socrates were led to believe would never engage in. Anyhow, have you ever heard of the term platonic love? Are, are Joe and Susie dating? No, nah, it's just platonic. Oh, that's too bad. It means it's not romantic that sort of thing. Well, this is one of the two big love dialogues from Plato's, um, if, if, from Plato's writings. And um, it's sort of interesting to read through. Again, if I want to know what Plato thinks, I'll go read Plato. Right? It's, we're going to see what Plato meant by platonic love, uh, reading the first half of this book. Um, his account of love was meant 
to engage very specific problems. And what it is, right, what it becomes, right, is, you know, very much framed by those specific problems. So, um, uh, again, right, um, what does being a citizen in the context of a democracy mean? Right? In contemporary terms, we're very concerned about that. What does love mean? Right? It's, it's one of the most powerful and important sort of emotional attachments and kinds of relationship in our contemporary society. Reams has been, have been written right, on love. Right? So we're engaging with one of the first succinct Western attempts to engage the question of what does it mean to be in love and in what sense is it healthy or useful or can be healthy or useful. Right? So we're going to engage with that. Now, um, I divide this course into three sections. Uh, so we will engage with two theorists and um, then have a section test. Now, these section tests I'll get into a little bit more when I turn to the assessment. Um, but nonetheless, this semester I'm doing um, short, like page to page and a half um, expository essays, uh, specific, directed, with explicit criteria. Right? So um, you'll have plenty to, to, to work with um, for these tests. So the first section does that. Right? So that's totally ancient right? philosophy. Right. There's nothing in that pile of books between Socrates and Plato that's not BC. Um, we linger again uh, in the ancients in this course uh, because I think it's important. Um, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics um, has to be one of the, uh, the more important books written in the history of Western thought. Um, it's uh, one part ethical theory. Right? It's one part child rearing ma manual. Right? It's named after Nick Micaeus, who was Aristotle's son, who was his editor. Right? And it's one part self-help book. Uh, there's sort of a bootstraps method in the three sections of this that we'll take a look at. And it's based on his metaphysics, which is a term I'll introduce you to in the general introduction and pre-Socratics video and use throughout the semester. Right? It's an important term. Um, in very general terms, it means uh, the, the, the area of philosophy that interrogates the underlying nature of truth. Right? So um, that's going to be Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. One more thing I'll mention about this. This is how to make yourself happy right? is the subject of this. So, so far, we're uh, democracy, love, Happiness, that's the puppy dogs and ice cream, sort of smiley face portion of the course, right? Following that, we will turn to a one Mr. Thomas Hobbes and his, no, that's the wrong book, I'm holding up the wrong book, here it is, um, Thomas Hobbes and his big scary mullet looking guy um, uh, on the cover, uh, that's the Leviathan, right? Named after a big scary sea monster, meant to represent the political state, right? This has to be one of the most important and still talked about in contemporary cir uh, circles, right? The political theorists are still working through Leviathan um, for really doing a systematic, scientific sort of anatomy of the political state, right? He starts with a conception of human nature and then argues for why we need a strong, stable government with rule of law. It's kind of a frightening argument, but it's also kind of an interesting argument because it says something, perhaps, about what it means to be a human being who's subject to power, right? So, power, right, might be um, your key word for this particular text, right? Then uh, we're reading two dialogues, uh, then we'll have another section test where you write me essays, um, and then we move to the final section of the class where we engage with Soren Kierkegaard, right, who has more pseudonyms than I have pairs of socks. Um, it, generally, whenever he wanted to take up uh, a differing, a differing uh, philosophical position, he would take up a pseudonym and a whole persona. Right? There, there might be somebody who makes this hard-nosed ethical 
argument. So he turns to his persona, Judge William, right? Um, he's got a sort of a skeptical philosophical um, a, a persona by the name of Johannes Climacus, right? He's got an astute sort of a Don Giovanni kind of character that he um, takes on when he wants to argue from the perspective of immediate desire. Anyhow, we're taking a look at um, two companion works. Um, one is the concept of anxiety and the other one is called Sickness Unto Death. So you can tell we're in the happy part of the course by this point, right? So we've gone Leviathan, anxiety, and um, despair is the sickness unto death. I hate to give it away, but it's in the first sentence, right? Um, of, of sickness unto death, so I don't feel like that's a big spoiler. Anyhow, um, Kierkegaard is a religious existentialist, right? Uh, who argues that taking a leap of faith is absolutely necessary in order to give meaning to our lives, but he's an existentialist, so it's all couched in our freedom. Very interesting position. Uh, we're going to take a good, long look at um, what amounts to a sort of philosophical psychology, right, uh, that emerges from Kierkegaard's work. Now, religious existentialist, atheist existentialist. Um, in fact, uh, Nietzsche, right, in the church roster for the cemetery where he was buried, the note is, here lies Frederick Nietzsche, a known antichrist. Right? Well, he wrote a book, it's in here, it's called The Antichrist. Doesn't really mean what you expect it to mean, but nonetheless. Uh, we'll be taking a look at um, uh, this great thinker. Um, I, the, my par portion of my dissertation was based on Nietzsche, and um, uh, this is a very important work called Twilight of the Idols, or How to Philosophize with a Hammer. The hammer that he's referring to is a tuning fork, and basically the idols that he's referring to are our most sacred values. Right, so um, basically what he wants to do is critically evaluate and revalue the values that we take for granted. Because if we just hold values as givens, then they become dead dogma and cease to give our life meaning. Right? So um, what Nietzsche is going to do is sort of sit a lot of the values of Western culture on their head, offer a sustained critique of the history of Western philosophy. It's, an, it's a nice thing to do at the end of a course. And like I say, this portion right here is all we're reading of this book, so you don't need to freak out because it's thick. Right. Um, so um, I'm very interested to see what you make of Nietzsche. Um, he's maybe the most misinterpreted and misappropriated philosopher in the history of Western philosophy. I hope to correct um, some of that and um, introduce you to this important thinker. Right. So um, I do it this way, and you're probably asking why I didn't just get a textbook like this one. Right. Here's your basic sort of who is this? It's Norton, Introduction to Philosophy, that sort of thing. Well, a couple of reasons. These cost your left arm and your right leg. Right? These are expensive books. It's actually cheaper to do it um, the way that I have done it. The only book that is um, sort of expensive is uh, The Essential Kierkegaard. Like I say, there should be used copies of this flying around. Um, so uh, it's actually cheaper to do it the way that I'm doing it. And on top of that, remember when I said that um, if I want to know what Plato thinks of Platonic love, I'm going to read Plato, not somebody else, not Wikipedia on Plato and Platonic love. Um, yeah, I, I'm a big believer in going straight back to primary texts, right? And what you get when you turn to an anthology like this one is... Uh, Joe Schmo or uh, Rosen, Brian, Cohen, Harmon, uh, and Schiffen, Schifrin, rather, on the history of Western philosophy, and not Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Hobbes, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche 
on the history of Western philosophy. I think it's important that we actually look at the text that we're going to talk about. Does that make sense? I hope so. All right. Uh, one final reason that I don't use these, but rather do the cheap pile of books instead, is because I can't find one of these with excerpts from the books that I want to discuss. What I try to do is build a conceptual arc so that you can understand right, how these ideas have developed over time. Right? Because basically everybody does this. Every philosophy professor builds a conceptual arc. It's just, I don't want to use somebody else's arc. I want to build an arc that will be meaningful to you. Right? So um, that's what I'm up to there. So um, basically what I'm doing um, is uh, three videos, short-ish. I see I'm over 25 minutes as it is right now. Uh, the first one, which is just concluding, deals with the course. Next, we will move to my least favorite topic, uh, the course policies, and then we will move to assessment, the assignments, that sort of thing. So um, yeah, that is what we are doing. And um, I've fallen into the habit of pointing out that on the fourth page, one, two, three, four, fourth page of your syllabus, um, I have laid out the, a tentative schedule for the course that lists all of the important dates. On the top of the fourth page, I, I even note, you might print this page and keep it handy to stay on top of the course schedule. So um, that is, I, I work hard to actually lay out all of your dates, all of your readings, all of the video material I'm going to be presenting um, in this one easy to keep a hold of kind of guide for the course. So um, it, it, that's there for your reference. So uh, next on policies.